Welcome to a place of wellness and healing for both your body and mind. Get ready to live a happy, healthy, energized life that totally rocks. You're listening to Straight Talking Natural Health, a no BS podcast for busy women who want to ditch the fatigue, find balance and feel great with your host and naturopath, Jules Galloway. Today's guest runs a club that, in her own words, you never wanted to be in. But sadly, it's a club to which many of us could subscribe or have been a good candidate for in the past. It's a club that I think is on the way to having way too many members if we don't start taking steps to avoid it. You see, it's called the Burnout Club, and it's a place for women to learn a new way to live, work, and most importantly, practice self-care. And by self-care, I do not mean some pissy little manicure or massage, although they're nice, but think of it as a complete mindset shift and habit change for many, many women who need it. Kind of like rehab for type A's, shall we say? So let's chat with the reformed type A herself who created this amazing resource, Please welcome to the show, Jess Jones. Hi, Jules. Thank you so much for having me. What an awesome intro. And we should say that this isn't just for women, although it is mostly women who listen to this podcast, but blokes, all three of you out there who are listening to this, this is for you as well. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) So tell me, Jess, in your own words, uh, what led you to the point of, I think you really... Your whole life brought you to a point where you couldn't not create this club, could you? Yeah, absolutely. I started to build my uh, fifth or sixth business earlier this year. And as I was going through the motions doing that, I realized so much of what I was trying to share was my, my own stories about the journey that I've had over the years and the way that I now am able to live my life and manage such a hectic schedule, but do it a whole lot better than I used to be able to do it. So once I started to get into that, it became pretty clear that this was a business to share my stories and my learnings uh, with other people, particularly business owners, to help them on their own journey and to hopefully pull them out of burnout and then avoid it returning altogether. Mm. So how did you burn out in the past? What, what happened with you? Because six businesses sounds like a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> you mentioned type A. <laughs> reformed, reformed yes, type reformed. A. Reformed. We're definitely yes. better. <laughs> we are. We are. We'll just keep telling ourselves that. <laughs> right. Yep. Uh, so, so, yeah, what's your burnout story? Uh, my first burnout story was 2017. I was running my previous business, Saw Collective. It was a regional business women's network Uh, covering Australia. We had five locations at the time that I sold it. So mid-2017, I caught a cold from one of the kids. That was all okay. And then it pretty quickly turned into the flu and I found myself bedridden for days and managing a really nasty temp and hallucinating and still like tapping away on my laptop. You know, I had a part-time marketing role as well as the business, as well as an 18-month-old and a four-year-old and a partner who was pretty sick of my lack of work-life balance. It was honestly just work, really. And uh, things were hectic. Things were pretty full on. But I was riding this high, this passion slash obsession I had for my business at the time and the community that I felt like... I was put on this earth to serve. And I know that sounds huge and egocentric, but I really was determined to help the people in my network grow their own businesses and reach their goals. So I was on this massive mission with this huge vision of having, you know, 10,000 members in Australia by the end of 2020, I believe it was. <laughs> <laughs> and I just uh, had uh, about a week, sorry, about a month prior. I'd come off a five-day Rise for Regional road trip where myself and another businesswoman and our two baby daughters drove an Audi from Geelong to the Sunshine Coast in Australia in five days. It was 2,200 kilometres and we held five uh, free events for businesswomen along the way and we interviewed 22 
business owners and we wanted to shine this light on regional business women and, and what their lives looked like in Australia. So it was a huge campaign and it was about seven months in the making. So I dare say my body had just had enough and forced me to stop. Oh my goodness me. Why do women do this to, <laughs> why do we do this to ourselves? I think for me, it's that I've always felt like I need to prove myself. And that comes, some of that's ingrained in our culture, some of that stuff that you take on with you from being a little kid or a little girl, being told you can't do this and you can't do that. You know, I grew up in a family with a celebrated footballer as a dad, AFL footballer, and you know, that was huge and that really determined the course of our life. We moved from suburban Melbourne to the country to follow Dad's footy and and then cricket as well. And I just wanted to follow in his footsteps and I was, you know, rep- repeatedly reminded that I couldn't because I was a girl. Fortunately today there's, you know, AFLW, there's women's yeah, football. Yeah. And that's so bloody awesome for the generations of today. But I, you know, didn't have that back then and I just wanted to play footy and be like my dad. And, uh, you know, back then as well, we were told we couldn't do certain roles and it was unlikely that, you know, we could make this impact that (laughs) men had previously made. So I think mine is wrapped up with a whole lot of baggage from being a kid and being a little girl and being told, no, you can't, you know, you're a girl. Yeah, and I'm sure that translates not just across sport in in Australia, but also in corporate. And like mm. like you said, like we get told there's certain roles that are not really for us, and yeah. there's there's still that that it's there's that gender inequality at the top going on even now. So I've noticed with a lot of a lot of women in business uh, or a lot of women in corporate, there's that real. I can do it mentality now and it Mm. is available to us, but we have to work harder, push harder and that real hustle and grind mentality that seems really, uh, it's, it's throughout both entrepreneur and business circles, but it really worries me. Yeah. It really worries me that, that we're at this, like, I love that we're at this point where we know that we can do all those things that men traditionally did and we can Mm. have those roles and they are available to us but it's like we have to push so hard and suffer so much to get there yeah 100 percent. and without sounding cynical because I am an eternal optimist I still feel like as much as we say you know it's getting better and there's more equality and people are supportive. I still feel like there's a couple of generations that are lagging and it, it's still so part of our history that, you know, I think there's still people out there that believe that women can't do what men can do. So, you know, for a while I think we'll be pushing and we'll be hustling and we'll be trying to prove them wrong and it might take a few more generations before that actual shift occurs Mm. and we absolutely can do everything that men do but I just wonder whether we are doing even well we are we're doing more than men are doing because then we come home and we run the households and we raise Mm -hmm. the babies and we're we're managing all of that back end as well yes life admin (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> oh, don't even get me started. The life admin. So how do how do we do life better? Like I know we we still need to manage businesses. We still need to look after babies. We still need to, you know, actually have a social life somewhere in there as well and, and do things that fill our cup. How do you teach women to have it all but in a, a more sustainable way? I believe it's about being really clear on what your definition of happiness looks like and working around that. So if you have a certain lifestyle that you're wanting to attain, I think it's important to set your goals based on that if you're not there already. So whatever that looks like, success is different for everyone. That definition of success is different. So if you want to only work four days a week, 
then, and you're not currently, you need to work out what you need to change in your life, what support you need from other people, and perhaps what you need to sacrifice in order to have the lifestyle that you dream of. Because it is possible. We just need to be really strict and we need to set some boundaries and we need to be okay with asking for help because it doesn't make us any less strong or able to do all of the things that we do. In fact, I think it would empower us to be able to manage a whole lot better if we were able to say, hey, dude, I need help or, you know, family member, I need help or uh, parent from school doing pickups, you know, I need help and it's, it's totally okay and just, you know, be available to help that person if they need it as well. Yeah, it's interesting that you talked about the definition of happiness and the definition of success because sometimes I think they we tie them together and maybe they can be two different things. Mm. Did your definition of happiness change after you had the breakdowns? Like, you know, you're bedridden, you're hallucinating. Like, does that change what you want in the world? Yeah, massively. I My business was all encompassing and that was by choice and it made me realize you know after asking some asking myself some big questions it made me realize that as much as I loved what I did and how I served I wasn't really finding that there was actual joy like pure joy in my life that didn't have to do with the business and I made a commitment from my sick bed that I would find something that brings me some happiness that has nothing to do with being a partner, a parent or a business owner that was just for me. So I used to do salsa dancing about 10 years ago, absolutely loved it. And my mum was competing in Latin and ballroom dancing at the time. And I was truly inspired by that and thought, you know what, I'm going to give this a crack. So I literally (laughs) signed up for a class about 20 minutes from my place Uh, I think two weeks after that and um, went along and absolutely loved it and had this whole new, you know, family of dance friends that had nothing to do with business or didn't even really know who I was, which was awesome as well. There was a certain anonymity and the ability to kind of just show up as myself with no expectations um, about anything really, which was kind of awesome. It was like a fresh start and a clean slate. And I got to just go along and do something that was great for me that brought me joy and that kept me really fit and healthy as well. Because prior to that, health and wellness were not a priority for me at all. I was not really exercising. I was eating okay, but you know, it wasn't really something that I looked at as important enough to put on my to-do list because everything else came first. Mm. But then in typical type A fashion, (laughs) you took the ballroom dancing a fair way, didn't you? (laughs) (laughs) I did. So at that point... You wasn't just dabbling, folks. Oh, no. No, not this one. No, I don't know how to dabble. I just don't know how. And that's okay. I've embraced this you know, at this point in my life, I get who I am and I'm okay with it. I just know that I need to be careful about the way I manage my passion and my drive and my energy and that it's put to good stuff and good people. So no, I'm not a dabbler. I, six months later, I committed to finding a dance partner and we started competing. So we were traveling around Victoria. Yeah, you did. (laughs) uh, Yeah, and competing. And in between comps, we were training. But from that day, that that week or so that I was crook in bed, I sort of made these huge life decisions. My partner at the time, he and I were pretty unhappy. And look, some of it was due to my obsession with the business that I called passion, but, you know, it was kind of an obsession. And my, my obsession with success and striving towards these goals, which you know, they, they don't end because I had achieved something, then I'd be on to the next one. And, uh, yeah, that, that definitely put a strain on our relationship. And, uh, you know, along with a few other contributing factors, we just weren't on the same page anymore. And we, I made the decision while I was sick that by the end of the year, I would sell my business, which was a pretty big call to make, but I knew it was probably the right time for me and decided that, I should end my relationship as well. And I didn't believe my partner would 
ever be able to do that. And I knew he was deeply unhappy as well. So I got to the end of the year and 19th of December, I separated with my partner, my kid's dad. And I think it was the 1st of December, I sold the business. So by New Year's Eve, I'd you know, (laughs) achieve those kind of goals I'd set out for myself. And I don't mean to say that in a way that takes something from the significance of that, but I knew that that's kind of what had to happen for myself and for my partner as well. And we are like great mates now. So we were best friends for Uh, three years before we got together and we're still really good mates and have an an amazing relationship that people always observe and can't quite believe. You know, we speak almost every day because we have this really awesome thing in common and that's our two beautiful, amazing children that definitely drive us mental but also bring (laughs) us a lot of joy and laughter as well. And he's got a lovely partner now and he's truly happy and that is what is good for me too because I want him to be happy. So it was a huge year of change. And then, you know, once that happened, that was it. I went headfirst into competing in Latin and ballroom dancing and travelling around and training my butt off and it was kind of amazing. You know, it was really quite incredible until until things sort of started to fall apart again. Yeah. So what happened then? So I'd spent the year competing and having an absolute ball. My dance partner at the time needed to wrap it up by the end of that year and I'd found someone else that was interested in dancing with me who was two or three levels higher than I was, but naturally I was committed no, to right. the cause. Yeah, no worries, mate. I'll be right. You know, I'll train harder. I'll put in more hours. You know, I have had mirrors in my lounge room. I would train at home when I wasn't at the studio. I was all in and that was great. I had resigned from a job that I was in that I'd kind of lost the love for. So I just miraculously found a job once I'd put it out there that I was resigning and looking for something just, you know, as the universe does, <laughs> something came up and my friend called me and said, oh my gosh, I've got the perfect role for you. I interviewed for it and then interviewed again and they changed the whole role based on my skill set and my experiences. And it was perfect. It was the dream job. And just before three months in, which was the 5th of December, I was made redundant And it was two days before the Australian National Championships that I'd been working really hard towards. And I just thought, you know what, that's okay. This job wasn't meant to be. I'll just focus on the the biggest comp of the year and get through that and then everything will be okay. So a couple of weeks out from Christmas, you know, did the comp. It was all good. Christmas came and went. News came and went. And I got to January and I guess it just kind of hit me. And I realized, you know, all of a sudden, oh, hey, I'm unemployed. Suddenly being alone mattered a bit more. I had no uh, income, obviously, and I started to feel a little bit stressed, but I had my dancing. So I thought, hey, I'm going to really focus on this. I've got more time on my hands until I can find some work. So I'll train harder. I'll be the best damn dancer I can be. And then I found out the dance partner I'd lined up couldn't commit anymore and everything sort of just felt like it was unravelling. That was really the the uh, straw that broke the camel's back, I guess. Um, I was still learning at my studio and learning new dances and styles. So normally what would happen is a student would choose one or two dancers to learn per term. I had heard the most that anyone had ever done was 12, so I committed to doing 12 for that term. <laughs> <laughs> ended up giving up on one so I did the 11 and I pushed myself really hard really hard and this was the start of 2019 I started seeing someone who was a friend that I've known for a very long time and that was feeling quite cushy I found a job that was pretty well below my capabilities but I needed an income so I took that on and everything was okay everything was ticking along okay and Uh, The week leading up to 
the day I had to be assessed for the dancing, uh, the, the new dances that I'd learnt and then perform them in front of about 100 people that night. And I had to perform a couple of the gold level dances and I had friends and family there and this new kind of guy in my life and everything was feeling pretty cool. But the week in the, that led up to that, I was really sick. I had stomach aches. I was dizzy. I was at the studio trying to train and it's really hard to dance when you're feeling dizzy and ill. So it was a bit limiting, um, but I pushed through the dance were all good. You know, I got, like, I guess, a high distinction type level in most of what I did, uh, celebrated a birthday. And then the week after that weekend, the same sort of thing happened. I was in bed. I had stomach aches and dizzy and and um, was feeling pretty rotten. And then the the casual thing with the guy kind of fell apart and my role, my new-ish role was pretty soul-destroying and um, again, I just felt like I was plummeting into this darkness where I had no control and being a control freak, that was a very scary place to be. So how did you get out of this place? Uh, I ended up in hospital actually. So I had pretty much crashed and burned and had about four days in hospital being treated for anxiety and depression. I was pretty much unrecognisable and just didn't understand how I got there. You know, the the business that I had put me in this space where I was the face of the business and I was doing speaking gigs and did this road trip and we had a film crew that joined us and created a documentary out of it which premiered, you know, six months later. Like it was this crazy, amazing beautiful fulfilling life that I led and all of a sudden you know bang like I just had no idea who I was and how I got there and felt very isolated I felt like I let myself down I felt like a burden on my family and um, you know I was kind of disappointed in myself for not being the person I should have been being for my kids as well even though they didn't really know what was going on, I still felt really kind of ashamed that it got to that point. Yeah, it's really, it's interesting that that shame is the thing that comes up there. Mm. Like of all the things. Yeah, it's, that's, it's, it's kind of, it's distressing to hear that, that we do all of that to ourselves. And then when we're, when our bodies and our minds don't hold up, the first thing that we think is to have shame. Like, that's that just for me really just nail like really drives home the amount of pressure that that we put on ourselves as women mm-hmm. and and the expectation that we have of ourselves even when we start to break like the the disappointment we have in ourselves yeah it's it's huge and it was so much that i was letting myself down as well and it felt like it undid all of the things that I'd worked so hard for for so many years in my whole lifetime. It felt, and I know that sounds so ridiculous, but it felt like everything I'd ever done meant nothing because i just, you know, fallen apart. And, um, yeah, I just was not in a good place and I was trying to medicate with booze, you know, leading up to the, the hospital stay (laughs) and I just even while I was at hospital it felt like it wasn't really me it was like this weird out-of-body experience that and I was just kind of watching from above like who's this bloody train wreck you know she's (laughs) ended up in hospital and normally she's got her shit all together and you know going from that person that I was a couple of years prior to to this mess where I was asking for help and I needed help and I needed support. Um, That wasn't, that did not sit well with me at all. Not at all. So it hasn't, I mean, it really hasn't been that long. So it was 2019 that -hmm. you were in hospital and and here we are at the end of 2020 or potentially uh, when this goes to air, it'll be just the beginning of 2021. So you've come such a long way in such a short time. 
what were what was the shift that had to happen? What were the learnings that had to happen to get you back to where you are now? I'd started working out that year, so early 2019. I, you know, started at the gym because I wasn't dancing anymore. I was able to do weight training, which I enjoy. Uh, I didn't have to keep sort of lean and and scrawny like I was. So I started you know, looking after myself by going to the gym. But I remember being almost proud of myself because I could drink myself to sleep one night and then the next morning get up and, you know, run 10Ks at the gym. Um, yeah, that's dangerous. The, the ability to back it up like that is so yeah. dangerous. Yeah, it was. And I, I guess I was kind of um, in denial and doing such a great job of drowning my feelings and emotions and self-loathing with booze, which is so healthy. (laughs) So I was just on this dangerous, reckless path for so long. And I guess once hospital happened, that was definitely a wake-up call. And I think a lot of that was because it was that let down piece that I'd let myself down, that I'd let my family down. I felt like a child, you know, my mum and dad, my dad's partner kind of came to my rescue. Um, I was not coping very well with the kids because I was putting so much pressure on myself to, you know, be this awesome dancer and to, to keep up the job that I really wasn't enjoying and, you know, all of the things that I was doing and to still parent. And even though, you know, we've had 50-50 custody since we split and I was only having them every second week, as I still do, I just wasn't coping when I had them. And it was because of all the things I was, you know, doing to myself and not the ways I, I definitely was not looking after myself. So I didn't have the patience and love and capacity to parent when I did have them. And I used to get stressed out and anxious because they were young, particularly my daughter is basically a mini me. So pain in the ass, oh head strong <laughs> like machine of a little person um, who keeps me on my feet. And obviously as she gets older, it's easier to manage because I can recognize myself in her. So I know how to manage things better, but I also have the, the patience and love and capacity to now because I'm doing all of the things that are so much better for myself, you know, so I'm able to be a better person for them. So I, sorry, I forget the question. (laughs) I do too, but I love the tangent. (laughs) (laughs) How did you, yeah. What were the learnings that had to happen to get to, to where you are now so that you can help other people? So about a month after my hospital visit, I had another bump in the road which I won't go into now but you know I had a good week before that where I was like I've got to pull myself together for my kids for my family I don't want to be this person that relies on other people for help this is ridiculous you know I had a real kind of pep talk week and committed to going to the gym a few times a week and finding a job so the weekend or the the few days I spent in hospital I had my mum resign from my job for me um, cause it was certainly a contributing factor to, to me ending up in the way I, the state I was in and, you know, I found myself unemployed again. Uh, so I, this other hiccup bump in the road happened and it kind of set me flying backwards again. And that took an extra lot of work to, to come out the other side of and, um, I, you know, again, sort of just drowned myself in booze to cope and to not feel the feelings. And I was sort of exercising, but, you know, I wasn't really looking after myself, obviously, because I was still drinking every night and I was looking for work. I remember at one point I had applied for about, I think I counted up about 270 jobs that I'd applied for. And, you know, look, some of those were roles that were beyond my capabilities, but I was going to have a crack anyway. And others were, um, you know, below. So 
it was a real kick in the guts to not be able to find one person that wanted to take me on. But, and that's something that, you know, I took quite personally and it certainly didn't help. It just, you know, dug that hole deeper and it was even harder to pull myself out. But eventually a friend, an old friend said she had a a job going at her organisation and would I be interested. It had nothing to do with anything I've ever done before, but it was a job, it was a good company, it was an income and it was a reason to, you know, kind of get my shit together a bit and get out of bed each day at a decent time and, you know, travel into the city to do this job. And that that presented a huge shift because all of a sudden, you know, that worth came back. Oh, someone wants me. Someone sees my resume. It's good. Someone enjoyed that interview. Someone thinks I'm capable. Someone thinks I can contribute to this project positively. And all those things are great, right? You know, they make you feel you're able and you're okay and you're good enough. So I started this role and it was amazing how much that helped change my perception of myself. It wasn't even about anyone else really. I'm sure, you know, hopefully if you asked them, my family would say, would have said, you know, we still think you're great and we love you even if you're unemployed. But my perception of myself was that I was worthless, that no one wanted me, that no one, that I wasn't employable, you know. I must add that my family did dub me the very endearing nickname uh, runaway train after my <laughs> <laughs> breakdown last year. I love that. Yeah, look, it is what it is. It's not a lie. <laughs> so they were fantastic and so supportive of me going through that mess last year. And yes, that job definitely helped. It wasn't, uh, you know, this this role or work that I was passionate about. It didn't matter. It gave me purpose. It gave me an income. And a few months later, a a dear friend of mine reached out and said, I have your dream job. And she knew a little bit about the mess I was in last year and she knew what I was looking for. And she basically created the role for me at her organisation and I still have that role today. So I started there in January this year, 2020, and it's been an awesome role and organization to be part of and I'm still very grateful for it because it just gave me the opportunity to shine again and to use all of my almost all of my skills and my you know everything I've learned over the years uh, I was able to kind of showcase that and for people to really appreciate that so I I'm guessing that I really attach my happiness to feeling like I'm contributing in a positive way and that I'm making an impact and that I'm, you know, worth something. So there's probably a lot in that as well. But I started this year off really positively. I had that dream job. I started going to the gym three to five times a week and then COVID happened uh, about eight weeks after starting the role and I began working from home and with absolute respect to the so many millions of people that have been really horribly affected by everything that's happened this year, uh, this year for me has been a massive turning point in my life. 2019 for me was my lockdown. That was my absolute horror. Worst year of my life this year has been um, life-changing and I will never forget it and the the lessons that I've learnt and the positive changes I've been able to implement and the things that I can see myself as a person, as a parent, as a daughter, as a friend, the, the change is huge. So a big part of that has been exercise, um, it's been about finding the joy. It's been about setting boundaries. It's been about doing what I want to do and doing things that are for me rather than trying to people please all of the time. There's so many things I've learned just this year. It's been quite magic and I'm very grateful for it. Oh, there's so much in there that I, oh my goodness, I was writing down words and circling them like a mofo while you were talking. <laughs> like, it, there's just, there's so much good stuff in there. But, but do you know what came out, what stood out the most for me just then 
was that everything changed once you decided that you were good enough. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder how women would approach their lives, their careers, their businesses, their relationships, their everything, how we would do things differently if we already had that belief. I wish I had the answer to that. I think just naturally, unfortunately, what happens is years and years of conditioning and it's from society, it's from the way we were brought up, it's the communities we were raised in, it's the things we see on TV, it's the music we listen to. There's so many things that are going on while we are growing and they contribute to you know, where we find ourselves today. And there's positives and there's negatives to that. But I think it's when you, when you get to the point when you realise that you need to be the one that controls that, that's when you're able to say, hey, I've got this. This is my life. Life is too bloody short to be playing by anyone else's rules or listening to anyone else's BS. You know, this is my opportunity to own my life and not let it own me. Um, And that's when the real magic and change happens because you realise, you know, it's up to you. It's not up to anyone else. Mm. And when we decide that we're good enough, we create the boundaries and stick to Mm -hmm. them and we allow ourselves to find the joy. And so all those things that started to happen for you, it it seems to me stemmed from that, that change in belief. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, I'm only a couple of months in, but I still would like to add that I made the decision to give up drinking altogether because I finally saw the the damage it was doing and it was mostly due to the negative self-talk I was observing. And I was frustrated because, you know, on paper, everything else was perfect. I had done the work in every other area of my life. I've worked my ass off to get to this point of happiness and satisfaction and loving myself. And, you know, that's years of work, but especially the past, you know, 18 months, the the changes that I've made and the lessons that I've learned, and some of them have been really hard And you need to go through that to learn the lessons from them. I get that. It's a cliche, but it's so true. You need to be burnt by people. You need to have your heart broken. You need to question yourself and your worth and your purpose. And they're hard things to go through, but it's absolutely worth it. So when I realized that everything else, I was just absolutely smashing it and not wanting to celebrate it too much either because, you know, you don't want to... I guess, undo what you're doing by babbling on about it. You just want to put your head down and get the work done. But I realized that everything else was working really well, but something was just not right. And, you know, it was the realization that even after, and I know, look, this year has been really tough on so many people. And especially if you're living on your own and I live on my own every second week and uh, working from home, the challenges that we've all faced and it's been quite isolating and I know we've all stumbled across some dodgy habits, you know, like drinking alone at night uh, because you're bored and I had many nights where I'd be bored but even when I had the kids I'd be cooking dinner and just be in this heightened state of stress and anxiety because I had so much to do in those few hours before they actually went to sleep. And then after that, you know, get some work done as well. So I found myself with this habit of, I'll just have a glass of red while I cook. Oh, I'll just have one with dinner. Oh, I might have a beer now. And, you know, before I knew it, I'd had a few drinks or four to six drinks some nights before bed. And I'd wake up in the morning and say to myself, why are you doing this to yourself? Why are you destroying yourself? And I wasn't waking up feeling sick. I wasn't waking up feeling anything really. I felt fine. I was able to still kick goals, you know, at my job. I was able to 
work on my business still. I was able to get up at the crack and get some work done before the kids woke up for the weeks I had them. I was able to work out almost every day. And so part of me is like, well, this is working fine. What are you talking about? What are you being such a sook about? This is normal. Everyone drinks. And then the other side of me was like, yeah, this is self-destructive and you're not feeling your feelings. You're still trying to repress, you know, I don't know, crap experiences, feeling rejected, (laughs) all the negative things and stuff that we go through. I was just, yeah, just trying to quieten, 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 sorry, (laughs) with, um, I was trying to, uh, um, can't think of a better word now. I think, I think we are trying to dull. Yeah, on numb, <laughs> yeah. numb, numb. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. I was trying to numb myself with alcohol, and that was the big thing that had to change. And uh, I, you know, I made the decision to do it almost two months ago, and I am the happiest and healthiest and strongest and fiercest I've ever been in my life at 39 years old. So go figure. That's amazing. And it's, it's interesting. I guess there are no coincidences. But it's interesting that the mutual friend of ours that introduced us to each mm. other or that uh, made us aware of each other is someone who's also given up alcohol permanently. So mm. there are no coincidences. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. And she's, uh, she's a bit of a legend in her own right. So she sure is. Yeah. So it sounds like the the alcohol consumption that was creeping up and creeping up, that was a warning sign for you that we now know in hindsight was the warning sign. But what are some other warning signs that women should be and men should be looking out for? Uh, if, you know, because I know you work a lot with people who are heading towards burnout. What mm. are the things you would like to make them aware of as being the red flags that they need to heed right now? Yeah, oftentimes it's just losing your passion for what you do, whether that's a job or a business. It's it's noticing that the passion is gone and that you've lost your drive. And, you know, if you suddenly think, oh, I used to love this, <laughs> what's going on? Or that you can't possibly find the time to take care of yourself because you're so busy or you're permanently exhausted and feeling overwhelmed like you're drowning and hearing yourself say, I just don't have the time for self-care right now. You know, I used to say that all the time when I had my old business. I didn't have time for all that crap. (laughs) Self-care, whatever. I used to post about it on social media. I'd share it with my community and encourage it. But I was secretly one of those, you know, hustle sleep when you're dead you know you've got goals that scare me and all of that I loved that stuff you know I was going to be Richard Branson <laughs> I had massive dreams and it all started with reading his book when I was like 22 so you know I I thrived on that ideal and then it got the better of me because I was saying all those things to myself and I was overwhelmed and drowning and my sleep was impacted uh, because I was just burning away, you know, stressed and, and, um, and drained and exhausted but forcing myself to keep going and you shouldn't have to force it, you know. You shouldn't be feeling like it's overwhelm and that it's stressful. You should be happy with what you're doing and feeling accomplished and organized and for me organization and structure and routine is how I thrive it's not for everyone but if I start to feel like I'm slipping or that I'm drowning or that I'm overwhelmed I do a quick assessment of what's going on that day have I got a to-do list do I know what my weekly goals are this week is my space organized am I clutter free you know, emotionally and around my desk and my clutter free and what's my calendar look like this week. And if there's too much going on, pull back. The world will not stop if you reschedule a meeting or if you cancel, you know, drinks with friends or if you need to change your plans, it will be okay. You have to look after yourself. If you don't look after yourself, you will break and your business won't work if you're broken. Yeah. 
that's it. It's just and not worth it. Nothing beautiful ever got created from that place of brokenness and overwhelm. No. no. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Jess, that was honestly, this, that chat was so amazing and so full of amazing gold nuggets and, oh, my God, such a bloody call to action for so many people out there, I hope. Uh, if someone is listening to this and they're like, oh shit, that's me. Um, how can they find you online? (laughs) Yes, I'm everywhere and love chatting to people and helping in any way I can. So the website is theburnoutclub.com. You can find me on Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn as well. And if you are struggling or you just want to have a chat or need a hand, just please um, shoot me a message and I'll do whatever I can to help you. Oh, thank you so much. Jess Jones, here is to a healthy, happy, burnout-free 2021. May we spread all of those good vibes to all who need it. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jules. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed listening to Straight Talking Natural Health. If you like what you heard, make sure you hit subscribe so that you never miss an episode. Also, head over to my website at julesgalloway.com. There's a free quiz on there to see if you're at risk of burnout. I also have an amazing ebook called Heal Your Adrenals, which is a must for any woman with adrenal dysfunction, aka adrenal fatigue. When I'm not podcasting, I'm seeing clients all over the world via Zoom. I love working with fatigue, thyroid issues, autoimmunity, pyrrole disorder, mold illness and complex cases, to name just a few. So why not book in and let's work together? All of this and more is available right now over at julesgalloway.com. That's all from me for the time being. I look forward to diving in with you again in the next episode. Bye for now. This has been a production of thewellnesscouch.com. Check us out on Facebook and join in the conversation on facebook.com forward slash thewellnesscouch. Subscribe to each show on iTunes and check us out on Twitter. The Wellness Couch, streaming wellness into your lives. Whilst the Wellness Couch presenter endeavor to provide accurate and helpful information to their listeners, these podcasts cannot take into account individual circumstances and are not intended to be a substitute for health and medical advice from a qualified health professional. You should always seek the advice of a qualified health professional before acting on any of the information provided by any of the Wellness Couch podcasts.